author event, Crazy Horse, The Lakota Warrior's Life and Legacy. I'm, I'm William Matson. I'm the author. This is a Floyd Clown Sr., his grandson, and the uh, administrator to the Crazy Horse estate. Uh, it took us 12 years to put this book together. And these kind of books belong in the schools. Um, the history of this continent did not start with Christopher Columbus. It started long before that. And one of the first lessons I got was um, went out to uh, on the reservation where Floyd was, and he had relatives that lived at a place called the Owl River. On a map, it's the Moreau River. The reeds that day were about that tall. And um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. So I had my camera, and I'm going to take a, a good shot of the Owl River because I like doing documentaries, and we got to have a shot of that. And so um, I'm wading through the reeds, and suddenly two great big owls came out of the reeds, scared the bejeebers out of me because those are big birds. And one of them landed on the other side, of the uh, of the river, and you can see that owl in, in Journey of the Heart, <laughs> and uh, the other one went down the river, and um, that told me that that's why it was named the Owl River, and the Moreau River made no sense at all, um, just like the Yellowstone River uh, was the Elk River because that's where the elk came to to water, the Cheyenne River was the Good River because it tasted good and the water was clear. The Grand River was the river that was bigger than its banks. That meant it flooded. It told what was there. When it was renamed, it didn't say anything. It was a step back from the connection to the land. Very subtle. I didn't even notice it until that day when the owl came out of the reeds. It told me uh, that the renaming of it, we had lost a connection to the land that most of us probably never realized and never would have. Um, this journey for me started before I was born. My dad was in the 7th Cavalry during World War II, and the drill sergeant used to ask, who won the Battle of the Little Bighorn? And he said the natives did, and that was the wrong answer. He was punished for it. And I heard this a lot as a kid, um, and apparently he held a grudge because I'm his son. And um, he always wanted to write that wrong. He wanted to, to write something that said from the native side, but he, he uh, got caught up in life. He wasn't able to, uh, uh, to fulfill it. He spent a couple of weeks in the Black Hills, but that's not long enough to make a, a, a true connection. And he was trying to do it after he retired, uh, and he started to, but then he got lymphoma. And on his deathbed, he asked me to do it. Well, at the time, it wasn't really my direction. But you can't say no in that kind of circumstance. So I said, yes, I would. I did not know a soul in the plains. Not one person. Uh, I was living in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, actually, Portland at the time. And um, when you don't know anybody in a whole area, what do you do? You go on the internet. So I went on the internet. This was 1998 when dial-up worked sometimes. <laughs> and um, I, I found one person on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation named Eugene Little Coyote. So I gave him a call. I said, uh, do you have any stories to the Battle of Little Bighorn? Or the Battle of Little Bighorn? He said, yeah. I said, can I come out and get him from you? He was in Lame Deer, Montana. He, he said, sure. So I got on an airplane, flew out to Billings, rented a car, went to Lame Deer, and uh, I don't think he expected me to show up because he, he shoved his lunch in his drawer and he said, what do, you, what do you want? Who are you? I said, I'm the guy from Portland that asked you for the, for the stories of the Battle Little Bighorn. You, you got him for me? No. Uh, do you know somebody that does? He said, follow me. And he took me to the Dull Knife Library, took me to a rack of books and said, read these and walked away. 
So I did. I read about 300 books. They didn't all make sense. This guy had a theory. That theory would end up in another book, in the bibliography. Now it's starting to become a fact. And uh, the, the history was all messed up. Even books that, uh, that are revered, like uh, um, uh, Black Elk Speaks. He knew Lakota, but he didn't know English. And so when he told the story to the interpreter, who told the story to the author, the author didn't have to go back and check, check it out. He didn't have a chance to proofread it. So uh, there's a lot of mi misinformation in there. Uh, but people take that like, like Black Elk actually said that. I know that to be true because when we did this book, after the 12 years, it took a year to write and six months of corrections. I knew these guys for 12 uh, years. We hung out. And even after I wrote it, I still didn't get it. And so they correct it. They say, well, you did okay, Bill. But over here, boy, that's, you gotta, that's no good at all. You're way off. So it took six months where we were on the same page and it could be published and then demanded that the publisher not change anything. So it's just as, a, as the family wanted it. They had last say. Um, anyway, I, I, um, after reading these uh, books, uh, being a documentary filmmaker which is nothing more than somebody that doesn't have the money to make a feature film. I was working on a script for Crazy Horse. And in none of the books did it say who the women were that raised Crazy Horse, what their names were. But that was only 125 years ago. I figured somebody knew. So I decided to go back out to um, uh, South Dakota but before I did that, I found somebody on the Cheyenne River Reservation because the, the Internet had matured in the three years, 2001, and there were some new names on it. And uh, so I, um, I contacted him, and uh, he said he knew somebody that knew the names of the women that raised Crazy Horse. And oh, That's all it took. And so I, I, I made an appointment with him, and, and uh, I flew out there, and I... Uh, he was on Cheyenne River Reservation, and I, I drove out to Cheyenne River, River Reservation, and he stood me up. So I had three days on my hands uh, in a motel room, and I decided, well, I've just been studying the history. Um, maybe I should take a look at the spiritual and cultural side of the Lakota. And so um, I, uh, I decided to go to this place called Bear Butte. I figured all the spirituality happened at the top, right? Well, halfway up, my dad spoke to me. Now, he'd been gone for three years, but he spoke to me, and he said, open your heart, and I knew what that meant. I needed to know the cultural and spiritual side of the Lakota, or else I would not be qualified to even think about writing anything, even picking up the pen, anything. And so I went home that uh that uh, winter, and I read all the cultural and spiritual books I could find. And each one, they has ceremonies in them. They say the ceremonies are this way. This is the only way we do them. There's no other way, but they're all different. And so um, I, I decided, well, I, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And I, I flew back out to South Dakota, and I went to Bear Butte again, and I met with the head ranger there. Uh, Jim Jandro, he's still there, and he's a Dakota. And I was telling him I, I, I really wanted to know more about the Lakota uh, cultural and spiritual side and, and also the women that raised Crazy Horse. Who, they, who were they? And he said, I got something for you. And he went back to his office, and he brought back uh, Floyd's younger brother, Doug Warriel's phone number. And so I called him. I called Doug, and... Um, uh, he answered the phone, and I told him who I was, and he says, yeah, we've been waiting for your call. We knew you were coming from the West. I thought, well, how did he know I was coming from the West? I didn't tell anybody we came from the West. I didn't say where I came from, but it was an invitation. So I went, and I brought my script with me. I'd spent a whole year working on this script. I thought it was the best thing I ever did. I, I mean, after all, this was 
for my dad. It was his dying wish. So I, I'd, I'd worked on it and, and got into detail and, and put my whole heart and soul into it. And, uh, you know, I was emotionally involved with the script. I handed it to Floyd and Floyd read three words and threw it on the table and said, this is garbage. So I pretend like I wasn't hurt. And uh, then, they, then he said, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tell you the true story if you have a good heart. So I was wondering, well, how am I going to show I have a good heart? I'm only here for a couple more days. And so we'll take you to Sweat Lodge. I thought, oh, good. I, I, I read about that. So um, I started to fire up and. And I saw people bringing wood to the fire, and I thought, well, I'm going to help out. So I started bringing wood, and pretty soon I was running with the wood. Then I was sprinting with the wood, and the rest of them started just standing back and watching me. And I can remember their uncle saying, this guy kind of scares me. Because I guess I was over the top with enthusiasm. Uh, anyway, we, we went into the sweat lodge. A wonderful experience, beautiful experience. Those of you here who have been in the sweat lodge, you know what I'm talking about. Those who haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, but we were in there for uh, four rounds. We were in there for a, a while. And then afterwards, um, uh, I came out, and they came out, and nobody said how my heart had done. I was wondering how it had done. And nobody said anything. Uh, the silence was deafening. And so we went back in the house, and... Uh, we were eating, and I happened to say, you know, I, I wish I knew your language. I would have sang with you, and because it felt that good. And that same uncle never went in the sweat lodge. He was the firekeeper. He just brought in the hot rocks on a pitchfork and opened and closed the door, but he never went in the whole time. He said, you know, they don't let me in there, because when I go in there, I sing Merle Haggard. And... um at the time, it was the funniest thing that, that I'd heard because I was walking on eggs the whole time, and he took the heel of his boot with that one statement and crushed the eggs, just squashed them flat. And from that time on, uh, uh, we went out uh, for the next 12 years uh, with a camera, uh, and um, I, I shot all the uh, uh, places where they had, the, uh, they had their oral history uh, sites and landmarks and reference points that told um, uh, where they were and, and um, uh, it was a that was a remarkable uh, experience so I got to visualize it and, and we even ended up putting in a, a, a four-part documentary um, six hours so you know it takes a whole day almost um, to watch it all but uh, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience, and during that experience, I learned that they really knew their genealogy really well. I mean, better than anybody I'd ever met. And I thought I knew mine well, and I found out I didn't, and um, I just knew that I'd come from Sweden and Norway and, and England, and that's about it. So I figured I better, I better bone up so I can talk on the same level as them. And, uh, our, our book is in Norwegian and, and German also, and the Norwegian publisher brought us over, and I was able to find my Norwegian roots and uh, all the way back to uh, my uh, great-grandmother who was born in a sailing asylum. Um, but that's where they gave birth in those days to the people who didn't have a lot of money. And then uh, I, I met my uh, Swedish family in Stockholm at a book signing. Um, which was very emotional for me because my parents didn't know who they were and my grandparents didn't know them. And so it was like uh, I had, uh, it was like a rediscovery. Well, it, uh, I wasn't originally supposed to write this book. Uh, another gentleman was and he got called to Afghanistan and uh, I thought maybe we were all done after I'd done the documentaries and uh, but I'd seen them, and, and they honored me and asked me to, to write the book. So, um, so that's, that's how I became the author, the as-told-to guy. It's their story. Um, and as far as the spirituality, I, I had my doubts about that for a while. 
And uh, those got cured one one uh, evening. Uh, it happened over a new sweat lodge. Floyd had built a new sweat lodge. And he said the whole Lakota nation was going to sweat in there. And I looked at that and I thought, to myself, I thought, that's kind of a tight fit. Um, and uh, we go 12 of us to be in there and 14 of us, but... I, you know, to me, that wasn't the whole nation. This, I didn't say anything. I never said a word about it, but I had my doubts. And then one time I went in there and these five uh, Lakota men came out of the rocks. Didn't acknowledge me. Just stared into the rocks. Uh, they had a blanket on, on their bare shoulders. And on the left, there was one in uh, a profile. And uh, there's four rounds in the sweat lodge. So it's dark, and then you open the door, it's light, dark, light, dark, light, just four times of each. And um, this was on the first round, the first time it became dark. So when they opened it up, I, I moved a little bit because I thought, well, maybe I'm just sitting just right to see this. I still hadn't totally bought in. And so uh, I moved a little bit, and um, sure enough, they came up in the in the second round, and the third round, and the fourth round, and um, I became very excited. I didn't say anything during the ceremony because uh, that wasn't the right thing to do. But I I waited till afterwards, and then I came up to Floyd and I said, I, I know what you're talking about. I understand now when you say the whole nation's going to be in there. I, I I saw them. I saw I saw your grandfather. She said, Yeah, we know. You doubted us, so they showed themselves. So I, I, I can't doubt that. I can't doubt them anymore. Um, and and uh, the person on the left, uh, because it took, it made such an impression on me. I can I can still see him in detail uh, when I think about it. Um, two years later, there had been a book that was out of print that I had not read, and uh, the name of the book was Custer's Conquer, and in there is a drawing of Old Man Crazy Horse, Wagula, the father of Crazy Horse. And that was the person on the left. So that was pretty remarkable. Um, doing, um, being on this journey is probably one of the best, is the best experience I've, I've had in my life. It's the best way I've spent, uh, well, I spent 20 years at it, and so it was, it's been a fabulous experience. And when my dad asked me to do this, I, I looked at it as an obligation initially, uh, but uh, he had a lot more wisdom. And so um, he really did something. So uh, uh, I appreciate y'all coming out. Uh, I'd... Uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, to Floyd uh, Clown Senior, and um, he's the administrator and uh, of the Crazy Horse Estate and a grandson. Thank you. Good evening. Um, this is our two hundred and thirtieth book signing and talk since we started. Uh, we started from the West Coast and we're going to the East Coast. So this is where we're at right now, 2.30. <laughs> but um, 2001 um, was when we were told to tell our identity who we are. And uh, there's a federal court case uh, with the Crazy Horse Estate that uh, went to federal court in 1990 with this, it was called the Hornell Brewing Company that we took to federal court. And that was the brewing company that made the Crazy Horse malt liquor. So this is what our family took to federal court in 1990. But my father, um, who's in front of the book, Edward Clown, he was a pipekeeper for the Crazy Horse family, for our family. So all the work that he did on this court case before he went to court, and then he left for the other side in 1987. 
So he never got to see this go to federal court. Because it was uh, three years later is when it was in federal court. And then 2001, um, 11 years it took, uh, we won our case, 2001. Everything pertaining to my grandfather's name was awarded back to the family. So um, this is when, 2001 is when we were told uh, to tell who we are now. So from 1877 till 2001, nobody knew our family. So in this federal court case, um, the acting administrator for the Crazy Horse State at that time, we knew that he wasn't from our family. And federal law says if you're going to be an administrator of an estate, you have to be blood from that estate. That's federal law. So we knew that the acting administrator wasn't from our family. So we filed an injunction and to determine the blood heirs of the Crazy Horse Estate. It was time to show proof of what everybody had been assuming. So when we started this in 2001, our grandfathers, they said, no more assumptions. It was time for truth now. And they said uh, an assumption is when you tell a story for so long that after a while you think it's true when it's not the truth. That's an assumption. So uh, 2001, in this federal court, uh, I stood up for my father, and uh, this is where we showed in this federal court the paternal side of the blood tree of my grandfather. And we showed on this blood tree where my father was and where I was. And um, when we showed this in federal court, um, at that time, nobody in this world ever seen the blood tree of my grandfather. So uh, when we showed this in federal court, the paternal side, because that's how the government looks at us, on the male side of the families, when the acting administrator seen this uh, blood tree on the paternal side, and he seen that he wasn't on there, he said he was on the maternal side, the mother's side, the woman's side of the family. So we showed the maternal side of the, our blood tree of our grandfather. And then he's seen that he wasn't on there either. So this is where we've been waiting since 2001 to now, We're waiting for the closing date of this court case. Before we were able to tell our identity, there was a lot of families, a lot of bands, nations, claiming my family and my grandfather. Well, now it was time for proof of truth. So uh, when we showed these blood trees in this federal court case, 2001, the paternal and maternal side, the paternal side wasn't contested. And that's how the government looks at us. There was no contest. What they contested was a maternal side. because That's where the acting administrator said he was from. So that's what we're waiting in this federal court case. Uh, to finalize and like that. So, but um, in 2001, when we made these blood trees of uh, paternal, maternal for crazy horse, um, what's legal under the federal law, um, a legal blood tree, this government brought one to my mother in 1972. This government made a blood tree for War Eagle of Meadowakton, Dakota. And when they made this blood tree, um, that's when they found out that my mother was the closest granddaughter to War Eagle. So the Secretary of State office brought a, a paper. Um, they had an account uh, up in Washington when in 1838, the United States confiscated 20,000 head of horses of the middle walked in. And 5,000 of them belonged to my grandfather. He had 5,000 head of horses. So this money that was in this account um, 
to compensate for the horses they took. They asked my mother, uh, since you're the closest granddaughter to War Eagle, uh, and he's the one that's recognized by the government, they wanted her to sign for to release this pony claim. And just this past year, we just now got the final of this pony claim. So it took a long time. But the first payment was in 80, 81. So it almost took, <laughs> you know, um, over 35 years to finally finalize it. But um, when they brought this blood tree of my grandfather in 72, um, there was 20, there was 5,000 blood family of War Eagle. And that's on my maternal side. He's my grandfather of Midewakton, Dakota. But when they brought this blood tree in 1972, this federal government used six documents, a probate, enrollment, allotment, census, ration, and church records as the six legal documents recognized by the federal law to prove your identity. And uh, so this is what they used in 1972. And so this is what they taught us how to make a blood tree in 2001 for Crazy Horse. We used these six documents to make this blood tree. And uh, when we completed this in 2001 and filed this in federal court, the federal court recognized this as the only blood tree so far in this court case as a legal blood tree recognized under the federal law. So um, uh, 2001, uh, when we made this blood tree for our family, Crazy Horse family, 2001, there was 3,000 blood family of Crazy Horse today. There was 600 on the father's side. There's 2,400 on the mother's side. So this is who I represent as administrator for the Crazy Horse estate. I represent 3,000 blood family. And I'm also administrator for War Eagle. I have 5,000 blood family also as a middle walk to Dakota and Crazy Horse is Lakota. But um, when I was told to do this, it was time for truth, time to tell the truth of our family, of my grandfathers. So uh, when we showed this blood tree to the blood family of Crazy Horse, 3,000 of them, a lot of them didn't know they were of the family. That's how quiet that their parents and grandparents kept it because we were in hiding. This government was out to kill us. So that's why we were always told when they talked of our family to listen and walk away up until 2001. When now, publicly we could say, or I could say I'm a grandson. Now show me your proof, what you've been claiming for the last 124 years while our family was in hiding. Because I could show you my proof who I am in this federal court case by identity. So uh, when we showed this to the blood tree, to the family of 3,000, and we've seen that um, some of the children, grandchildren, didn't even know they were of the family and like this, this is when we decided to make a book for them. So this book that we have was originally for our children and grandchildren, that they would know the identity of their grandfathers and grandmothers, where their blood comes from, their bloodlines. So um, when we uh, started this book, um, our grandfathers, 2001, when we were told to tell our identity, our grandfather said, we're going to send you help from the four directions. And the first one to come was Bill. He came from the west direction. He came from Portland, Oregon. And the one that was supposed to write the book for us, his name was Kevin Dida. He came from North Carolina. He was from the east direction. 
But when we were getting ready to start on this book, um, he got called back into the military and got sent to Afghanistan. So when that happened, we knew that he couldn't look at it or write it the way it needed to be written and looked at. Because for him, it was life and death over there in Afghanistan. So uh, this was since Bill seen a visual of our oral history, we asked him to write it for us. And the South Direction are the lawyers that are representing us today in determining the blood areas of the crazy horse estate. So um, we know that when this court case is done, that North Direction comes. And that's an international lawyer that's coming to stop the use of my grandfather's name around the world. So when we were almost done with this book, my grandfather said to share it with the world because they use my grandfather's name around this world. So um, this is why uh, we're here today, to share it with you guys. Why we were in Norway uh, this past summer, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, England, Ireland. We were in six countries over there in Europe uh, this past summer. But um, when we were uh, told to do this, um, um, when we made this book, um, how a Lakota family hands down their oral history, because everything for us was oral, nothing written down. So um, why it took us 12 years to verify our family's oral history. A story of our family, there's always a landmark or a point of reference when that event happened and like that. So this is what took us 12 years to verify. Um, whenever we found a landmark or a point of reference and we pinpoint where the family was camped at that time, sometimes we'll be standing where the family was camped when that event happened and like that. So we knew. When, when we knew that it was the truth that we were told and that we're seeing the truth, that's when we put that in the book because this was for our children and grandchildren. And we wanted to do it like how Lakota families, when they hand down their family's oral history, it was with truth. So when you hear a family story, you don't add on or you don't take away from a story that you were hearing that for the family. You have to tell it exactly how you heard it, as a truth. So that way, um, it's handed down for a long time like that in our families, Lakota families. That's how they kept everything oral and like that. So um, this is what um, we uh, verified our our family's oral history. So when we stood up in 2001 and told who we were, and we started on this book, there was 500 books written about my grandfather. There's movies that were made about my grandfather. When we made this book, finished this book, everything about my grandfather that I've written before this book now is assumption. Now there is non-truth. It's fiction because it's not the truth of my family and my grandfather. So um, when we made this book, you're not going to find no references in the back of this book where these stories came from. Because if you read a book about my grandfather before, you're going to find references in the back of the book where they got this story from this book or that book or like this. And they put that in the back of the books. But well, ours doesn't have that. Because we didn't take any of these stories from what was written before, you know, and uh, like that. This was directly from the blood family. So what we show back there is how we showed our proof in this federal court case with these six documents. But uh, when it was published, our publisher 
made it real small. I mean, it, it was called like postage stamp. You almost need a magnifying glass to look at those documents. So um, on the last, uh, on the first page of, of the appendix, on the bottom of the page, we put a link there that you could go to and click onto that link and you could blow up all these documents as big as you want them, like a screen that big, a theater screen, you know, if you can't see or whatever, you know, because us as the family, we have nothing to hide. We want everybody to know what was in there and be able to read it. And that was our publisher's idea, so uh, that's what we put in there. So um, when we uh, um, completed this book, uh, we did it like how oral history was handed down so that our children and grandchildren will hear of just one story of a grandfather or a grandmother, or one story of an event, like how oral history is handed down. Instead of 50, 500 different stories, it's just one story from the family. And that's how families' oral histories are handed down. There's only one story. So um, this is what, uh, as of 2001, we're able to do this now, make these corrections. So um, our family, um, uh, it started in, in 1877 uh, when our family went in hiding, when my grandfather got assassinated at Fort Robinson. But my grandfather, he knew that this was coming. Two weeks before the Battle of the Little Bighorn at a Sundance held today, Lame Deer, Montana, north of there, about six miles, was where the Sundance was held two weeks before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And at this Sundance, uh, this is where Sitting Bull was showing a vision of what was going to happen at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So there's a rock um, six miles north of Lame Deer today on Jack Bailey's land called Deer Medicine Rock. So on this rock is where they put Sitting Bull's vision of what was going to happen at Little Bighorn. So it's on this rock, this Deer Medicine Rock. And then right west of this rock, there's a rock that sister that looks like an owl sitting there. And the owl is one of our family's medicines. And so my grandfather, Crazy Horse, he was showing a vision at the Sundance. So he put his vision on the belly of this owl. And it was a vision of his demise, his death, that he put on this, the belly of this owl. So what he showed on this, this owl rock was a doctor standing there which was Melakuddy, and my grandfather standing beside him. There was a soldier with a rifle and bayonet standing in front of him who stabbed him twice. And my grandfather had the marks where he got stabbed, exactly. And with this soldier was his own people, his own kind standing with the soldier, meaning that the government and his own kind were going to do this. And it showed horse tracks up and down coming in, meaning he was to be alive coming in. But when he leaves, these horse tracks are laying down, meaning he was to be dead when he leaves, which happened 15 months later after he put it on this rock, what happened in Fort Robinson. So even though my grandfather um, uh, knew this was coming, his unconditional love for his family and people, he still preserved and protected the Black Hills. Because the Black Hills is our ancestral burial grounds of our people. That's our cemetery. So that's like today, a church with a cemetery beside it. People are living all over that cemetery, driving all over it. Well, that's what's going on right now. And so this is what uh, we want to correct. 
So uh, my grandfather knew that this assassination was coming. Uh, so when they called him to go to Fort Robinson, the reason why he went there was his government promised him a federal agency. So that was the reason why he went to Fort Robinson to meet his demise. That's where they were bringing this federal agency. So our family, um, um, when they were bringing this agency to Fort Robinson, uh, when my grandfather went into Fort Robinson, that's where what he put on that rock happened. That his own people and the government assassinated him. So um, when that happened, uh, the government brought my grandfather's agency. And at that time, Red Cloud and Spired Tail were signed for my grandfather's agency because they said, while well, the government recognizes us as leaders of the people, so we'll sign for it. No as sooner as they put their signatures down on this federal agency, the United States said that was an illegal transaction because only the blood family could claim Crazy Horse Agency because they knew his father was still here at that time. So uh, they took it back to Washington and under United States history, they made the act of 1877, when the United States confiscated 8.7 million acres, including the Black Hills. That's my grandfather's agency, Crazy Horse Agency. So this is what, uh, why we're in this federal court today, determining the blood heirs of the Crazy Horse Estate. When the federal law says you guys are the blood family, Oh, we want my grandfather's agency that you promised him in 1877. And they can't deny it because it's sitting in a sector state office in Washington, this federal agency. And it has a presidential seal on it. So uh, 2007, we had a friend when we were talking up at a little bighorn battlefield. His name was William Carrington. And he's a historian, uh, his grandfather, was here in 1866 to 1868 at Fort Field Kearney, which today is Story, Wyoming. And this is where the fa uh, Fetterman and the wagon box fights happened. So um, at that time, his grandfather was a commanding officer of that Fort Carrington. So that was his grandfather that was here. But he's a historian, and um, he said, I live in North Carolina. He heard us talk about my grandfather's agency. Can I go look for your grandfather's agency? So I told him, go ahead, go look. But I told my younger brothers, I want to see if he's really serious in what he's saying, because people say things and not do it. You know, so. And there he called back, and he said, I went to the Smithsonian. I went to the American Library of Congress. I didn't find it there. So that was when I told him where it was. You're a historian. And he did a lot of work for the Smithsonian as a historian in Washington. So they know who he was. Go to the Secretary of State office. That's where it's at. So when he called back, this is what he said. I went to the Secretary of State office and I asked, because they know who he was. He said, two security led me downstairs of the Secretary of State office, led me down this hall. They opened a door to this room, and in this room was a table sitting there with glass over the top of this table. And under this glass was Crazy Horse Agency, docket number, land description. And it had a presidential seal on it. And I remember what you said about that presidential seal. Under the federal law, when a president puts a presidential seal on a document, that's an executive order. And under the federal law, a presidential seal that's not broke is still law today. So he said, I remember what you said. I walked around this table and I inspected that presidential seal real close. The grandfathers didn't lie. 
it still has that presidential seal. It's not broke on this document. It's still law today. So uh, he called back and he verified 2007 that it's still sitting over there. So our grandfathers, when they tell us something, they never lie to us. So we don't have to go see. We have faith and truth of our grandfathers. Where today, when you're told the truth, you're going to go see it to make sure it's real, or you're going to go touch it to make sure it's real. When you're told a truth, you still have doubt, <laughs> and you still don't have enough faith in truth why you have to go check it out. Just like William Carrington. When he heard us, he still had to go see for himself. And when he's seen it, then, okay, now your grandfathers didn't lie. But for us, they never lied to us. Whatever they tell us, we don't have to go see it. We know it's there and like this. So this is coming yet when this court case is done determining the blood heirs of the crazy horse estate. And coming from Shan River, where the blood family's from, um, in this court case, um, the federal judge appointed three administrators. So I was appointed administrator for Shine River, representing my family from Shine River. And they appointed one from Pine Ridge and one from Rosebud administrators. And at that time, Harvey White Woman was for Pine Ridge, Seth Bickrow was for Rosebud. And they told these two administrators, you need to make a blood tree like what Shine River did. So what's legal in a federal system, under the federal law, a legal blood tree, you have to use six documents. And the first document was a probate, which is a death certificate. And uh, in our research, we found that they didn't keep probates of our people until 1904 and five, when they start keeping probates of our people. So what they recognized before probates was that when they put us on these federal agencies. Because federal agencies are made by blood families. So why they recognize enrollments and allotments of these federal agencies as proof of your identity, who you are. And then before these federal agencies, they recognize census, ration listing, and church records as legal documents proving your identity. So you have to use these six documents to show your proof of blood of your identity, who you are. So this is where um, these families that were assuming they were from our family, when they use these six documents, they're finding out that they're not of our family, that they forgot about their grandfathers and grandmothers where their bloodlines come from, because they were assuming they were Crazy Horse family. So as truth, we know that their grandfathers and grandmothers are happy they weren't forgotten, because they were forgetting them by assuming they were from our family. So this is what's going on back home right now. And some of them have a hard time with truth, because truth hurts sometimes why people shy away from truth. They would rather assume than tell the truth. It's easier like this. But regardless, it's still truth. You know, so, uh, but um, this is what we're waiting on in this federal court case. Um, when we started this in 2001, told our identity who we are and like this, 2001, there was 180 companies worldwide using my grandfather's name. Within the first year, 120 of them dropped a name. 60 that were still using it were making like that, 60 billion a year annually off my grandfather's name. So 2001, uh, the first one to call us was Liz Claiborne. She was making the Crazy Horse Collection in J.C. Penney's. So 2001, she made 500 million net in one year 
using my grandfather's name. So uh, when her lawyers called, I told my younger brothers, tell them I want 80% of that. So when they told them, the lawyer, her lawyers, we want 80%, her lawyers were surprised because under the federal law, we're entitled to all 100%. But tell them, tell her at the 2001, because she's still here then, that um, to take care of her employees that work for her, because that's their livelihood. Take care of your employees and whatever is left, you can live comfortably off that. So that was just one year. In 2001, she made 500 million net. So that's not counting from the first day she used a name until she quits using the name. So all these companies are watching this court case. When a closing date comes, they all want to settle out of court with the family. But they want to deal with the real family. You know, so that's why they're waiting on this court case to be done. So we know that our family will be in litigation for a while. And then this international lawyer in our direction stops the use of my grandfather's name around the world. Um, when we did this, the family, we did it like how my grandfather when he was here. My grandfather did everything by example. He didn't say you have to do it like this or do it that way. He showed it to you. He went and did it and that's what people followed. So today his family were doing the same thing, what he did. We're showing all red nations in the United States. This is how you legally protect your grandfather's name under the federal law. So we know that when this court case is done, Sitting Bull's family is next, Geronimo's family is next. Because in our research, Krajor, Sitting Bull, and Geronimo are the three most used names around this world. So we're showing them this is how you do this under the federal law and under the international law. So they will have protocol, they have a way to protect their grandfather's name. So this is not just for our family, but for all the red nations that are here. Uh, Chief Joseph family, or like this, all these names that were being used. But now each family has a legal way to protect their grandfather's name. So uh, we're the first family to do this under the federal law. So uh, like my grandfather, by example, this is how you protect your grandfathers. So um, these kind of things um, are family. And coming from a federal agency, Cheyenne River, when my grandfather's agency, this act of 1877, when the United States confiscated 8.7 million acres, including the Black Hills, that's Crazy Horse Agency. And coming from Shine River, a federal agency, when the United States created these federal agencies, they created on these agencies trust status lands on these agencies. And trust status lands are non-taxable. A non-Indian can't own it, sell it, live on it, or trade it. Trust status lands. Because I have some on Shine River where I come from trust status lands. So this is how we want 8.7 million acres, all in trust status lands. So this is a law that this federal government made for these federal agencies. Are they going to enforce it? So we're going to test this government. Yeah, um, there's 119 families that are entitled to Crazy Horse Agency. So uh, this is coming in. When this court case is done, then Washington is going to get tested. So we as citizens, when we break the law, we're incarcerated. So now we're going to see what, if they break the law, what happens. 
You know, so it's time to for truth now. No more assumptions and like this. So our family, um, uh, when we went in hiding in 1877, when my grandfather got assassinated, at that time, this country in 1877, when something wasn't under their system, when they didn't understand something or like that, they destroyed it. So when they assassinated my grandfather, the government said, if crazy horses like this, his whole family is like that. So the best thing to do is kill them all. That's when we went in hiding in 1877. Why nobody knew of our family. Because our nation was hiding our family, the Lakota nation. So um, in 1890, um, on my maternal side of my family, I have a grandfather named Spotted Duck, who the government labeled as Bigfoot. So 1890, when the 7th Cavalry found out that Spotted Elk Bigfoot was Crazy Horse's cousin, won't it knee happen? When they unarmed our people, killed women, children, elders, massacred them. But yet, United States history, they called it a battle and gave 20-some Congressional Medal of Honors in doing that. So we knew in 1890, they were looking for our family yet. My father, who's in front of the book, Edward Clown, his oldest brother, my uncle Mose, fought for this country in World War I in Europe. And uh, 1918, he got killed in Europe, in France fighting for this country. That same year, 1918, one of his uncles, one of my grandfathers, his name was Peter Wolf, publicly announced he was Crazy Horse's brother. When he did this, the government came and assassinated him in 1918, while his nephew fought and died for this country in France, in Europe. So we knew that they were still looking for us in 1918. In the 30s, that book that Bill mentioned, Custer's Conqueror, Bordeaux that wrote this book stated in his book that Crazy Horse is buried in the Pine Ridge area. So when my grandmother replied he's buried nowhere in the Pine Ridge area, this government came looking for her. Crazy Horse's little sister is still here. So we knew they were looking for us in the 30s. They were still hunting us. Why, growing up, when you talk of your grandfather, listen and walk away. Don't tell him who you are until 2001, when now I can say I'm a grandson. How are you related to me? Show me your proof, because I can show you who I am in this federal court my identity, who I am. So when we did this, 2001, we remembered our family that wasn't able to say that, who they were. Because my dad was a pipe pupil for the Crazy Horse family. Crazy Horse was his uncle. He was a nephew to the warrior, which he never got to say or tell anybody. So he never got to tell his true identity, who he was, or any of the family that left before 2001 or weren't able to say who they really were, like what we can today as the grandsons, and granddaughters, and like that, cousins, and like that. So uh, we always remembered them, you know, that uh, the family that wasn't able to do that. So. Um, our family, um, in 1948, we met with Jewel Korzak Jewelkowski. He came and met with our family, and he wanted to do a sculpture in the Black Hills. So the family told him, if you're going to do this, you have to do it 
with no government help. You have to do it by private donations. So Korzak said, I promise to do that. So when he made that promise, my dad's older brothers, three of my uncles, posed for the face of the mountain. That's how he came up with the sculpture of, of Crazy Horse in that mountain. But at that time, he was told, when you're done with the sculpture, you can't tell anybody how you did this. So he said, I promise. So he left for the other side in 1990 something, Korzak. He never told anybody how he did that. So when we were able to tell our identity 2001, um, 2003 at that Indian Memorial that was dedicated at the Little Bighorn Battlefield, honoring our Lakota and the Cheyenne grandfathers that, that fell at this battle. This is the first time this government ever acknowledged the Lakota and the Cheyennes for anything. So uh, to honor our grandfathers. So at that dedication, after it was over on June 25th, 2003, June 26th was Korzak's wife's birthday, Ruth. So we hauled our horses up to Crazy Horse Mountain and we did a little ride for her, for her birthday. And this is when we told her, her how her husband made this mountain, how it came to be. So at that time, she said, uh, in 1948, she was walking down the hall of her house and she looked into a room and she seen her husband working on something, but I didn't know what he was doing. Next time I walked by in the hall and I looked in the room, he was sitting back and he was done with that sculpture. And the next time I walked by and looked in that room, he was burning something up in a fireplace. He never told me how he did this. I never asked him how he did that. So 2003, she just not heard the truth of how that mountain came to be. So our family, we've always known that horse that my grandfather is riding on that mountain. That horse's name was Ian, meaning rock or spirit rock. That's the name of his horse on that mountain. And to remember a horse that he lost before Ia, his name was Joaquim, meaning thunder, why this sculpture is being done on Thunder Mountain, to remember his horse that he lost before. There's a meaning behind that. But only the family knew at that time. Now everybody knows. It's in a book. <laughs> so like that. So, um, so our, um, when we did that Indian Memorial Dedication 2003, the Crazy Horse family, we did a ride honoring our grandfathers. We rode from our family cemetery on Shan River to Little Bighorn. We rode with the youth 360 miles to Little Bighorn from Shan River. But like anything, 360 is a circumference of a circle. Why? There was a meaning behind uh, uh, why we did that right. And my grandfather, he always paid attention to the youth because he said the youth was the strength of a nation. The elders is the knowledge and wisdom of a nation. Why he paid attention to these two groups when he was here. The adults, they were on their own because they had to walk in their own shoes and like this. So um, we did a, a video of that Indian memorial called Journey of the Heart, the Great Sioux Nation Victory Ride. So we called that video. So uh, we show in there uh, where we rode uh, 260 miles, had 11 camps and like that. Yeah, it, was a, it was a good journey with the youth and like that. So, uh, but. Our family, um, um, when we were told uh, to remember everyone, like my grandfather, when we're legal under the federal law, who we are, we're in litigation with these companies because they all want to 
settle out of court. None of them want to fight it in court because they're going to lose. So to them, it's like throwing money away. So it's better to cut our losses or ask the family permission to use the name. So we're the first native family that they're going to have to ask permission if they're going to use Crazy Horse. So in our book, we have a trademark in there. So if somebody is using the name Crazy Horse and that trademark isn't on there, you know they're going to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they taught us. <laughs> How to do this like this. But, um, you know, uh, you know, it's time for these kind of uh, truths that um, our family, and the reason why we tell this is because our family was in hiding for 124 years. So our children didn't know who they were. So this is what we made for our, our children and grandchildren, which we're sharing with the world. So you get to read what our children and grandchildren are, are looking at like this, the truth, and like that. So our family, um, you know, when we're legal under the law, like my grandfather, we're still preserving and protecting the Black Hills with this federal agency that has trust status lands on this federal agency. So we're still protecting our cemetery of our people today. But this is just a wake-up call, because at the Battle of Little Bighorn, where my grandfather was, and like this, the family was, they were defending a land base of the Lakota Nation. And the Lakota Nation land base was the headwaters of the Missouri to the headwaters of the North Platte, the river boundary of our nation, the Lakota Nation. So this is the paternal side of my family, my dad's side. I'm Crazy Horse's grandson. On my mom's side, she had a, a colorful tree, my mom, my maternal side of my family. She was a granddaughter to Black Buffalo, a Minikoju, Lakota. And she was a granddaughter to Morningstar, Dawn Knife, Cheyenne. So those are my grandfathers on my mom's side. And on, that was through her dad. Through her mom was War Eagle. And War Eagle's wife was Wakpekute, Nakoda, and he was Dakota. So my grandfathers on that side are Dakota and Nakodas. So that's who I, I have grandfathers that are Dakota and Nakoda. And my, my mom's mom's dad was Paul Traverse. He was a Frenchman. So I also have a French grandfather. And Théophile Breuer, he was a Frenchman. He's a grandfather to, to us. And they came from Orange, France when they did their research where they came from. So I have relatives in France. <laughs> but this is who I am, my identity. Um, when you deny a bloodline, when you deny blood that's inside you, you're forgetting about a grandfather or a grandmother, where that blood came from. So it's good to know your true identity, who you are, you know, and then share it with the children, grandchildren like that. So when my grandfathers, uh, uh, they told us that you know, when the Red Nations were here before anybody came to this continent, when it was just the Red Nations here, in our language they said huhunupa means two-legged. This is how we refer to each other, as, as two-legged. 1800s, my grandfathers, they said this two-legged became makawicha. In our language, means earthman. So this two-legged earth man was a person that had no skin color. It was a person that had a red heart, fell for nature, wondered what was right, good, positive, true, sacred. 
And this person, when they stepped, he or she stepped outside their home and stepped on Unchimakha in our language means Grandmother Earth. When they stepped on her, they stepped with respect. So uh, this is what I'm supposed to remind the world. You're forgetting to walk with respect on our Grandmother Earth. You're forgetting to look at each other at your heart, not the color of your skin. So black, red, yellow, white was put on this earth with truth. And this is what the world is getting away from, It's truth. So grandson, remind him that this is the 230th time I'm telling the world uh, to look time to look at a person's heart, not the color of their skin. So like when we met Bill, we had to look at his heart first. We didn't look at his color of his skin because our grandfather said, we're sending you somebody from the West. So um, why we have to check his heart out, why he's sitting with me here. But um, to remind the world that this person, this two-legged earth man, human being, only each individual could do this. Nobody could do it for you. So when we started, my grandfather said, today, truth, honesty, and trust is missing in this world, grandson. Remind him. So this is what I tell the world. Whenever you're truthful and honest with yourself, when you don't lie to yourself, then you don't lie to God or the Creator, and then you don't lie to people when you talk to them, when you're truthful and honest with yourself. And when you walk like this, the people will trust you because you're going to do the right thing, the positive thing, the good thing, and like this. So this is when trust comes back. But only we could do this as each individual. Nobody could walk in your shoes but you, each individual. So it's up to each individual to make a change. And in 1918, when my uncle got killed in France, he was brought back in 1921, two years after the war was over. And we've seen the documents where they loaded him on a ship in Belgium. They docked in New Jersey. They were put on trains, and that's how they brought him back in 1921 to Dupree, South Dakota, where, where the family lives. That's where I live. That's how they returned my uncle. So um, after they were all brought back in 1921, the countries that were involved in World War I some of them protested in the United Nations. They said, why are these natives fighting for the United States when they're their own country? So to get around this, the United States in 1924 made a citizen act, made us citizens of this country in 1924. So the Lakota Nation, we haven't been a citizen of this country for 100 years yet. 2024, we're just now being an American citizen for 100 years when we've been here before anybody came to this continent. Yeah, so what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, so this is where my grandfather they said, this is when they put our nation under democracy, when they made us citizens. And my grandfather, they said, um, Democracy was a legal way to lie, cheat, and steal by majority rule. Why everybody has a right to vote today. So under this system, something bad could get voted in over something good by majority rule. And at the same time, they put our people under taxation, what runs this country. They gave us a social security number. 
we became a taxable item. So under democracy and taxation, your identity is your social security number. It's not your name. You could change your name a hundred times, but your social security number, that's your identity under the system. So this is where as truth. If you have land or anything under the system, you think that's yours. Try not paying your taxes for one year. They'll come and foreclose you and give it to somebody that will pay these taxes. So as truth, you don't own nothing under this system. So this is what they put our people under in 1924. When it's an I, me system, what they put us under. When these red nations, it was we and us. So like my grandfather, they said, when these red nations were here, there was no jealousy. There was no greed. There was no selfishness. There was no judgmental, criticism, superstitious, or fear. These seven English words never existed on this continent of these red nations. Where today, some people just live by those seven English words. And like that, so it's time to um, look at the truth. Time to, if you're going to care for somebody, our grandmother Earth, Mujimaka, time to stand up for her. Because as truth, if our grandmother dies, we all die. As truth, our grandmother is a living thing why all life grows on our grandmother, including us. This is a truth. So these kind of things I was told to remind the people and maybe they forgot and like this. So I'm just reminding. Time to look at each other's hearts, not the color of your skin. We're all equal under the eyes of the creator. Nobody above the other. We were put here with truth. This is what we're getting away from. But again, each individual is the ones that could make this change. Nobody could do it for you. So these kind of things, it's time for that now. Time to heal our grandmother Earth. Time to correct the wrongs, like what we're doing for my family. A lot of wrongs that were done to my family. But when you do truth, like how we were supposed to do this, a second ago is already in the past. That's truth. You can't turn time back. It already happened. But what you could change is now and the future. What you could change, what you have control over. But something already happened, you can't turn time back to change it because it already happened. So it's time for uh, these kind of things to uh, help each other out, to help our grandmother and like this. Think of others and like that. And so these kind of things I was uh, told to remind the world. And uh, this is why um, our family of 3,000, uh, you know, uh, were by example, like my grandfather, were standing up for the children, the elders, our people even the ones that are left before us that are buried, our ancestors, and like that. We didn't forget anyone. So um, we know that um, in the 1880s, um, when this country said, kill the Indian and save the man, took our children, sent them to Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Oregon, where some of the children are laying in graves with unknown as headstones. In our way of prayer, our way of living life, we have a way to find out what their names are and to return them back to their families so that they're not forgotten. So, <clears throat> so 
So these kind of things, um, our family is, is going to heal our people, bring home the children, and like that and stuff. So, but it's time to help each other out and time to heal and time to be truthful and honest with yourself. Don't lie to yourself and like this. So. But this book, uh, since it came out in 2016, some of you might have read it or anything like that. Uh, this is when we ask if you have any questions. And like that, they're going to have a mic, I guess, set up in the middle where you could go and uh, sing karaoke or. <laughs> 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 but when I was in Oklahoma, um, when I was talking, uh, saying that um, that's truth, coming from a federal agency, we could say we're the most regulated people on this earth. Because on coming from a federal agency, we live by five laws every day. We live by federal, state, tribal, county, and city laws that apply to us every day. So that's truth. We could say we're the most regulated people on this earth. But when I told this in Oklahoma, this elder native man was sitting in the front. He raised his arm. He said, me, he said, I live by six laws. I live by my old lady's law, too, he said. <laughs> so I'm more regulated than you, he said. <laughs> but in our culture, humor is medicine, so when you laugh, there's no stress. And like that, so it's good to, to laugh. And, and that medicine is really good. This program was recorded on May 16th, 2019, at the Ann Arbor District Library.